Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We've got a big episode for you, two very special guests, incredible overachievers, Ben O'Keefe, the test referee and eye doctor and all sorts <laughs> of other stuff. We've got Ricky Swinnell, groundbreaking commentator as well, to talk Women's Rugby World Cup. Plenty of things to talk about. In studio, we've got a guest motivational speaker, James <laughs> Parsons. And then over in Japan, Bryn Hall. And here we go, Ben O'Keefe, referee coming straight out of Kapiti, Ben. Yeah, I'm uh, calling in from the Noah. <laughs> Beautiful. Very, nice spot here on the Very nice. Now, Ben, we've got you on board because one of the things that we see every single week in our comment section on YouTube, you see it all through Twitter, you see it everywhere as people are talking about these laws. They're talking about the game, the speed of the game, the yellow cards, the red cards, all those kind of things. So we wanted to have you on and basically have a chat, I suppose, about a couple of things. Life being a ref under this kind of microscope, um, where the culture seems to have shifted a lot in the conversation, and two, how we go about getting the game to where we want it to be. Welcome on board. It's going to be light. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it, but it's certainly something that I've seen late in the game, so I'm uh, keen to have a chat about it. <laughs> awesome. So why don't we start with, with the first bit? I suppose ever since, I know, Russi's video and the things that have happened since then, the chat and the noise about laws and what's happening with the game and what needs to be fixed is so, so loud. And you guys are at the centre of it. You don't make the laws, but you adjudicate them. What's it been like over the last year or so being a ref in a game with so much controversy about the way the game is played? Yeah, it's been, been tough and thanks. You've, you've probably made me think that I'm the common denominator because I was involved in those games that Rusty was uh, <laughs> making a video about and you know, still refereeing now. So it's, uh, look, it's a difficult one. It seems to ramp up every year, especially now that we're leading into a World Cup and everyone's being competitive. I think you looked in the rugby championship and you know, teams are winning by you know within five points of each other. So the one-off calls that referees are making are actually under the microscope even more. So that, that's the problem. And I think also, you know, we went through a change with the head contact process, which saw more red cards and yellow cards and super rugby. Um, you know, us trying to create a understanding of why why we were doing that. So, you know, people were getting on board there too. So, you know, while while there are big changes, I think it also shows that people are just pretty passionate about rugby and having their say too, which, you know, as a referee, you know, we love. Do you think that we can get through this easily or is this something we're going to have to endure for a while? I think it just takes time. I think, um, for example, you know, when when all the all the fish sheds, they, they make the laws and, you know, what they're kind of going to change and, you know, what they see the future of rugby looking like, until you actually implement it on the field, you actually don't understand, okay, well, what's actually the parameters that's going to happen when, when the referee goes out and blows it? What, what's actually the outcomes when a player actually makes those tackles? So I think it takes, you know, it takes a few trial seasons and what I'm glad about is that we've actually started this process, you know, 12, 18 months before this next World Cup. And I guess rugby happens and laws happen in, in World Cup cycles. You know, they can't go and change things within certain windows. Um, so unfortunately, you know, we have to endure it as we start it, but it gets better every, you know, a few games in, you know, as referees, as players adapt, as coaches start to coach, um, you know, what those, what those priorities are. And, you know, I think we do get a better outcome in the end. It just takes a bit of time. You, you speak about that passion from the fans. Is it just about maybe we've got to help and, and you know, particularly us three here, educate that every game isn't going to be the same? It's different, not different, but applied differently every game. And, and you know, coming to turn, I certainly, that's how I thought as a player. I didn't look for consistency week to week. I always look for consistency within that 80 minutes. And it's a skill set to adjust your ability to the ref on the day. James, you're totally right. Like, a referee should be consistent throughout the game. That's what people want. That's what players and captains ask for. But I also think that the game's so dynamic that you'll never see the same, for example, high tackle. The exact same high tackle that happened last week will never, ever happen again. So therefore, when it happens next weekend, there might be a slight adjustment in terms of mitigation of the player falling. Um, the degree of danger might be a little bit different, so that's why it's a yellow card this week and not a red card like it was the weekend before. So I think as long as, as, long as we can educate the public, so that's, I think, the referee's job, but also the union's job, for people to understand, I think that's how we, we, we go forward. But you're right, consistency is key. And I think if we when we start pulling rabbits out of the hat, um, that's when people start thinking, okay, now this is you know this is wrong. And you know, potentially we saw that in, in July when you know there were some some difficult difficult calls that were made um, that you know the public probably didn't really get behind. Continuing on with that sort of that passion, we we saw it for for the All Blacks coaching staff and players when they lost a few tests. 
you know, and there's a lot of mental skills help. Is there that in, in refereeing? And, and do you feel that sense of, I suppose, that pressure of the public, you know, so zoned in on your performance? We, we do have mental skills help in the background, especially with the New Zealand rugby. We have that resource, but, you know, we're lucky that New Zealand rugby provides that. I don't think every union in the world um, has that. I think it's the main thing that referees need because, you know, what happens week by week is that we just go out there to get, we do what we're told to do, but we get criticised for doing our job. Yeah. Um, so that's quite, that's quite difficult when you, you know, wake up on a Sunday morning, you do your review and, you know, you have to make a big decision, but you're getting criticised for it. So and that mental side of it's really, really critical. And especially, I think, um, you know, 2019 World Cup coaches started getting stuck into referees. I think the next one, 2023, just with the uh, margin of error being so small with how competitive all the teams are, there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of focus on refereeing decisions. Um, especially with how even all the teams are going to be leading into it. Would you like to come out and be able to have that voice to be able to come out to the to the public and say, like, look, I went through all this, this is what I was thinking in this moment. Um, I might have got it wrong, I might have got it right. But being able to have that kind of avenue to come out and tell the public what you're thinking around big refereeing decisions? Oh, I'd love to. And I'm um, obviously a massive fan of this pod, so I uh, <laughs> listened to James last week when he talked about it. And I think it's a, that would be a really, really good thing. I think it can't happen post-match mm-hmm. because... Uh, post-match, obviously, you know, people are pretty passionate and emotional um, and referees, we don't have the time to actually have looked at the clips yet. It takes about 24 to 48 hours for us to sit down, go through the game, talk with our coaches, and actually come to a decision of whether we were right or wrong. But I think there's, that's the biggest piece in rugby that's missing at the moment is the education piece from um, the referees towards the public where, you know, we I work so hard at my job to go through, okay, what a deliberate knock-on is, what a play-on is, what a, what a knock-on only is. And I'd love to be able to describe that and discuss that and, you know, basically tell the public what, what my thinking was in that process and why I called, I gave a penalty try and a yellow card or why this week I've, I've given only a knock on. I think that will help, you know, the passionate people in the game understand the game better because at the moment, unfortunately, all we're hearing from is the side of the players. Um, and they never really say a lot about the referees, but the side of the coaches, you know, so we're only hearing the coaches' side. So at the moment, we only have their views on the table and, you know, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Obviously, they have uh, agendas that they want to fill, fill as well. But I think um, in terms of refereeing, I'd love for us to be able to come out, say, on a Wednesday. Uh, big, big decisions made in, in, the, in the weekend. Let's say the Lions series, you know, a few years ago in New Zealand. Um, I know that that referee, uh, Ramon Pite, he would have loved to have come out. And, you know, whether we're right or wrong, um, actually be able to draw a line and just show, OK, this is what we're thinking at the time. This is why we're right. This is why we're wrong. We're actually... This is the decision that was made, and this is the process that we go through to make it. And I think that, you know, some people that be listening to that at the next decision when they see it happen, they might be able to follow that process again. So I think that's that's, that's yeah. great, Brent. I, I love it. How far does it need to go? I, I wouldn't mind every Wednesday mm. um, talking about one to, one or two, th- one to three things that happened in my game um, to better explain it to the public, even if it was you know small. They just wanted to know my tackle process. Okay, why do I call? Um, you know, what does a tackler have to do when they're at the back of the ruck? Why? Why, when they're stuck in there, is it still a penalty? You know, because often players complain about that. Um, but I think you know there are there are big decisions that happen in a game, um, high impact decisions which you know th- they go unanswered and they just sort of get you know lost in the ether. So um, I think you know we do we all sort of know what they are. Um, often they're controversial, and I think you know referees we're all open to putting our hands up when we're wrong, but also always open to um, putting our hands up to explain why this decision was right. When I was a captain, you'd look, you'd have the ref for the week, and you'd, you know, our analysts, I'd get him say, okay, where does he penalise? What does he penalise for? Okay, he's really high around defensive penalties, so you know, like that's when you can start the conversation before the game to say, hey, look, we understand, you know, that that's a pressure point for you. We're going to make sure we take that half metre, and you start. Do you, do you guys know that, or is that just um, do you look into that where you give a lot of your penalties? Yeah, we do. So, yeah. um, and we certainly know that teams do that. I know that in the rugby championship, you know, we sat down with the, the international coaches and one of the first things they say is that we profiled you, we know you. <laughs> and then they just leave it like that. Yeah. And then you're sort of sitting there and like, oh, okay, what do they know about me? Um, but we know that like there's obviously all the stats out there and like I, I sort of know my style of refereeing. I have my philosophies around how I referee the tackle, the breakdown. I know what my 50-50 calls are, for example, and that might be slightly different to other referees. Um, so with all the stats that are available now, it's really good. Like I think every about three to four months, I look at those stats just to see, okay, where am I trending? Um, am I missing um, a, a lot of side entries at the breakdown? Is that something I need to clean up on? And what is my go-to decision when you know there's a jacker on the ball? Is it holding on or is it actually uh, not supporting body weight? 
And I think that information is really powerful. Um, and I, I do know coaches look at that. And what I'd say to them is actually, you know, you actually need to go back quite a few games to get a proper trend on a referee. Because, for example, um, three weeks ago, I hadn't, I hadn't blown a attacking scrum penalty, so a penalty against the feeding team in probably three months. And all of a sudden, I had three in one game. So you do referee still what's in front of you. You know, you have the skills to actually just blow what, what's in front of you. But um, the... Uh, you know, the stats can change depending on how far back you go. So mm. um, I think it's a good thing. Um, and, you know, refereeing, you know, uh, knowledge is power. So it, it helps you um, improve your own your own ability. On the flip side, you previewing teams. How, how, how much detail do you go into that? We, we you look at where they've been penalised previously, you know, maybe even things like not straights, um, you know, incorrect feeds, those sorts of things. Do you, do you assess both sides leading into it? a test or even a super rugby game? All those three things that you said there, I do not look at all um, in another team. So the only th- when I preview a team, and I think most referees do this, a lot of it is based around, okay, what does the team, what does the team do that is, um, that's common to their, their style, okay? So they play with a lot of speed, they like to um, send the ball wide, do they line out to maul a lot? And it's all related to around, okay, what's going to surprise me in this game? Because as soon as referees are surprised, that's when they start making mistakes. So, for example, I know that Otago, they do a lot of moves around the back of their line-out using that space in there, and, you know, it can get pretty complicated at the back of the line-out. So, you know, I know that, so that means that my positioning means that I need to quickly get around that um, that last pillar at the line-out or actually just stand at the front of the line-out. So a lot of it's around actually um, not being surprised, but positionally, where can I be to actually be able to make the right call? So I think gone are the days where we look at, you know, what this, what this loose head does, what this tight head does, because, you know, actually that was last week. That was against another mm-hmm. front row. Um, you know, it's more about, okay, the, the style of the game and actually how can I get in better positions to, to make accurate calls. I, th- I like to hear that because it means you're not fixed, you're not going in with a fixed mindset. Yeah. yeah. As you were talking, I was just thinking, why would you? Just yeah, shows like, how um, much work goes into yeah. it. We have, we have, I have a blueprint of how I referee and like I'm consistent when I follow that blueprint. That's why when I'm under pressure in big test matches or, you know, the last five minutes, the last two NBC games I did were tight. Um, I've just got to go to my blueprint and what, what I, how I referee and, um, if I tried to change every week based on how the team was that I that I that I thought and how they played, then you know I'd be all over the place. So we just referee what's in front of us, which mm-hmm. which makes it um, a little bit easier. A lot of players and a lot of I guess people talk around refs having a really good feel for the game, and I feel the really good refs they have a really great feel for that. And I'll use an example. Um, you might not have known this, but I'm going to use the example of the Blue Saders, um, the Blues, and the Crusaders in the final. That game had been officiated very differently around for the most of the year when it comes to head high tackles. It doesn't matter if it was shoulder or hand or wrist to the head or whatever it may be. That was getting penalised for a yellow card or a red card. But in that game, did your mindset change around? Does it change in big games around? You know, you're a little bit le- given a little bit more leeway and it wasn't a yellow card or a red card where it could have been officiated that in an earlier part of the season. Does, does your mindset change around in those kind of games, not trying to influence and kind of... I guess, have those kind of indiscretions come into, I guess, you know, a newspaper article or something that might be talked about after the game? Look, we, we're always going to enter into newspaper articles and people's debate after a game. Like, I've, I've accepted that. Um, it certainly doesn't change in, in finals or playoff games. I think, you know, there's examples of referees that have done that at World Cups and um, finals games where they've gone against their their sort of um, rugby IQ or their rugby refereeing a bit, like the way they referee during the season. It's just backfired against them. So for me, like uh, I, I didn't change, I didn't change like my process. But for example, the first, the first uh, act of foul play, which was I think against Nepo, um, mm. I, I didn't see anything live. I didn't have any feel for it live. So I was actually a bit surprised when my TMO came in for a check. So, I, so already I was sort of that, that's always a trigger for me. So if I've never seen anything, they're coming in for a check. Well, you know, potentially this isn't much. So um, when I saw the first replay, I was like, look, okay, I'm playing on from this because I don't believe this is foul play. And then we got slower and a close-up replay. And yes, there was head contact. So so for me, I'd already decided based on a process that I have, um, a process I'd continue throughout throughout the season anyway. And then when immediately after we had my TMO come in again um, for uh, the tackle that one of the Crusaders players, um, I guess what I was influenced, you've got to be consistent in the game. That's what James said. So I, get, I, I, just, mm-hmm. I just played on from potential head contact. And in this moment, there was another um, bit of head contact, which I thought actually this is different a little bit because we do have a bit of mitigation because the player's been stepped. Mm. Um, so I thought, look, we're going to be consistent in terms of you know one from each team. We're going to we're going to crack on and move on with the game. And 
Um, I liked how both captains, they they just accepted that and they moved on and we had a really great final. So whilst my mindset well, my mindset didn't do. change that final, which just sort of it continued. Um, yeah, sorry. It, uh, it, it just continued with, I guess, the experience that I have around, okay, how can you how can you be in those moments? If you're a young guy coming through and it's a young ref, is it more so just time in the saddle like it is with players for them to be able to get that feel and go through their processes like you're talking about? Or do, does it just take time if you're a young ref? What's the kind of advice that you try to give to them in those kind of moments? Yeah. Where a law, sorry, where a law could be like, sorry, sorry, Ben, where a law could be, you know, they think, oh, it's the law. We have to be able to penalise it like this to the book. It's scars on your back. You need to have experience. You need to have made those mistakes. And you, you got to hope that you make those mistakes in club rugby and not on TV because, you know, you only get a few opportunities on TV. Um, for example, like um, at the end of the Otago uh, Canterbury game, we had a not straight and you can't end the game on a not straight. Well, two years ago, I ended the game on a not straight. I can't remember which one it was. And, you know, I got in a lot of trouble for it. So, you know, you learn from those small things. And, and the key thing is that whenever you have a learning, you, you take it on board and then you, you use it in the next game. So... Um, that's why I always tell younger referees, and that's why I think a lot of ex-players are very good because they've had very similar experiences. Um, so they can actually come into a game and referee and actually get to a top level quite quickly. Is there a standard of um, you know sort of fitness testing, or is it similar to is it just yo-yos and broncos, and is there skin fold? I, I, I'm just interested to know to what level, and, and probably so the viewers know to what like the extent that goes to being a professional referee. What do, you, what do you mean, just Broncos? They are killer. <laughs> <laughs> we um, we we have to do testing about four times a year, and this is this is with World Rugby. Uh, one's a Bronco, so we have to get under five minutes in the Bronco. So the the twenty, the forty, the sixty meter five times. That's um that's what we have to do. And so the, some of the quickest referees in the world when we we're at Dubai, we're, we're running in at four sixteen. Um, so they're getting to the breakdowns pretty quick, uh, which is pretty good. So that was rapid. Um, that was an English referee. Um, we also have to do a 10 metre sprint and then a vertical uh, jump as well. So, um, you know, so and to be able to improve on that, we've got to be working hard during the week physically and, and in the gym as well, just to be able to do that. Some, some in the gym more than others, others obviously that you can see. You've seen some biceps popping out. In the oh, last James while, Dolman. Hey? Yeah, he, he's, he's definitely been in the cool rack, surely. Yeah, he loves a bit. Of, he loves the cool rack, but um, and and he'll love this. But he does. I'm sure he tailors his shirts as well just Has to make to. them pop a little bit more. Has to that that inseam. <laughs> he just clips that inseam, surely. <laughs> it's just an old trick yeah, of yours. Yeah, yeah, experience. <laughs> yeah, experience. Um, Thanks, James. Five minutes. That that surprised that surprised me. Like, I've got a chance to ref, guys. I can get under the five minute mark. I'm not getting to full Mate, 16. You can. Come along. <laughs> no, Come my along. days of Broncos are done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there was one thing that was going to stop you being a ref, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not the abuse, it's the Broncos. <laughs> yeah. I'd be no good with the abuse. <laughs> <laughs> you can just imagine. Uh, I'd, just, uh, <laughs> I'd, just, I'd hold on to it forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get over uh, it, just, yeah. the, um, just the question again, more so. You ref obviously um, a lot, and it's more so. Are there any areas around where you think the game where we could improve the game? Um, there's so many obviously little rules and everything that's been able to. There's so much change recently, uh, a lot. But is there anything that you think that the game could really work on that could make it more of a spectacle for for our, for our viewers? Well, I think like a lot of um, you know some of the rules that are happening in Queensland, which we might talk about, you know, to speed up the game. And I know that speeding up the game is a really uh, topical topic at the moment of what happened in the Bledisloe. But I think that's that's a big thing because I constantly talk to people and they just think the game's slow, ball and play time's 33 minutes in a good game, in an 80-minute game. And I just think, um, you know, there's certain areas where, you know, we can all work together to be able to do that. I think the one area in terms of, like, foul play is the uh, aerial contest. Uh, when I refereed mm -hmm. British and Irish Lions um, two years ago and what you see now is it's really hard to referee because there's just so many bodies around that ball now. And... I think we're really lucky that we haven't had um, a pretty dangerous injury from it. I mean, oh, well, we saw um, you know Bowden Barrett you know fall pretty dangerously over in South Africa. Um, so I think that that sort of area is something that needs to be worked on, and, and I potentially think there's people um, talking about it behind the scenes. So. I guess those those areas are probably something that needs to, to change in the future. Just for the guidance on what's going on yeah. here, when we talk about the Queensland Rugby Challenger Series law innovations. They're looking at doing some things within this Australian competition, which will be refed by decent referees, Nick Berry and Damon Murphy, where they just apply the laws that are already in place to the letter of the law to speed up the game. So things like those time infringements on rucks, kicks, etc. Things like line-outs. Um, if the opposition team isn't contesting, it's not blown up. It's just not straight because, well, they didn't contest. So why should we do one. that? Um, so those are the kind of things that we're talking about.
You, you mentioned ball and play, and it's a nice little segue to talk about the NRL Grand Final. Um, <laughs> we had to get there at some point. <laughs> had to get there at some point. Um, but 52 minutes state of origin ball and play versus, um, or verse, I should say, 30, I think it was 31 minutes for Super Rugby this, this season. I, I think the, U, the English Premiership's around 38, 39. Um, as you say, test matches around that 33, 34. Is it as, as simple as, you know, these rules that we're, we're talking about, you know, adjudicating the five second run, the 30 second scrum, do you think these will make a genuine difference? I think we will find out because, yeah. you know, if Super Rugby being 33 minutes doesn't mean that there's all that other time lost because if you've got a game with a lot of tries that are scored, which is Super Rugby, you know, you're going to have a low ball and play time because more tries, more conversions mm. um, versus, you know, the premiership where, you know, potentially 38 minutes, well, they might be just, you might be glossing over the fact that, you know, it's the, the it's nine points to three and it's, um, you know, a pretty muddy contest up in Northampton or something. So, I think we'll. I think you know the the positive thing is that we're looking at it and we're looking to change it. Um, I do like the mm. example of the you know the shot clocks, the you know thirty second, the sixty second for the conversions and the penalties. But but for example, again, you know, and, and as teams and coaches do, they always try and manipulate the new laws that come in. So we're always constantly having to work out okay how they're going to be manipulated. So in the top fourteen, they've got a shot clock, um, and instead of you know the sort of shot clock is sixty seconds for a penalty, ninety seconds for a conversion. What they've found is that a lot of the kickers are just watching the clock the whole time. And then when, for example, at a conversion, when 80 seconds have passed, then they'll do their kick. Because um, I, f I feel this would make a big difference. If one collapse, we reset, two collapse, it's tap, and, and you've got a tap. I feel that would increase the minutes of ball and play. Yeah, I, I like that. I think it will get away from... Because for me, a restart, and a restart like a line-out or a scrum, is the other team's infringed. And then the team that are putting the ball in or throwing the ball into the lineup are getting a restart in play. So for me, I see it as a restart in play. I love a good scrum penalty though, when a, a team can can dominate and push off the ball. Oh yeah. So now I think you're fear if that happens. <laughs> but if it but if it doesn't happen, then yeah, let's just let's just free kick and let's let's get on with it. I think um, I love the rule, and I'm I'm sorry, Bryn, you might not like this, but I love the rule about how the halfback can't come around um, and follow the ball and just cause a, a mess at the back of the scrum for the same reason as. I feel like it's a restart and play for the, the team that didn't cause the infringement. Um, but I think also the one risk of a, um, around the advantage around three phases is that uh, when we, you know, referees, we, we do get the advantage wrong sometimes, but we're trying to actually, in terms of feel for the game, is the team going to score? Are they actually going to get advantage? So you, you're actually seeing a lot of referees call advantage over more now. The fact that they want to stop or cap the advantage to three phases may mean that we'll get less ball in play because teams will go, OK, well, we're not going to go anywhere. We're just going to knock the ball on and we're going to restart. Yeah. So that might mean, you know, potentially less less tries because, you know, sometimes it takes more than three phases to, to get around the edge. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting. Though. I'm looking forward to it. If you call use it, how, through your mind, are you counting in your head one, two, three, four, five? Because it seems like that actually process of making the ruck as there's a ruck is actually going to take more than five seconds. So how would you officiate that as an example? I think what they'll do um, is that they'll, it's, it's only once the ball's available. So um, once the ruck actually is forming, the ball's not available yet, but when the ball then comes to the back of that ruck, um, and if you're trying to create a caterpillar ruck, that's often why we call users, is actually put pressure on that team to be able to use the ball so they're not creating this caterpillar pillar ruck that goes back two or three metres. Um, so it'll only be once the ball's been placed back by the ball carrier, um, contest happens, and then the ball's available, then we'll call um, use it and then um, you know we, we, yeah, we would count in our head often there's a lock that's standing first pillar that's counting for us as well um, and you know then we would call the ball over there as well I think the, what, the law around that is that we've been pretty loose around that you know we've sort of okay they're about to use it we'll call use it and we're just trying to speed it up and then if they take seven or eight seconds we're happy um, so a lot of all these things I think for the first two games there'll be a lot more spotlight on the referee you're going to hear the referee a lot but I think as teams adapt to it, um, you know, they'll end up using it quicker. Um, they'll, you know, do all those laws and all the changes um, just by the law book. So actually you won't be hearing the referee and it takes a spotlight off us. So I quite like it. Yeah, and I think that will sort of show in, in the Bledisloe, called that for time wasting. 
I don't think you'll. I think behaviours have changed already. Everyone's too nervous to waste penalties now, and they are just getting it out or making the decision. Um, and I think that'll be the same for that one. I think you'll get away from the centipede and um, you know probably look to you know either kick from ten or, or you know something else will come out of it. Um, because once you get once one gets done, then everyone knows you're almost on notice, mm. and that's how players think. Is they'll be like, okay, well we can't test that anymore because everyone's going to get pinged for that now. Like Bryn, you know, he'll just test it until he's penalised. <laughs> 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 is Bryn one of the nauseous blokes that you've had? Oh, surely. Tell us that surely. Bryn's like one of the most annoying halfbacks that you've had to deal with over the years. No, Bryn's, he's actually quality. And, and I know that he was asking about that law change just for his own benefit over in Japan. 100% so. he was. <laughs> <laughs> so just good. on that, Ben, sorry. Um, who's the most, the most smartest kind of, um, you know, the best banter that you've kind of had when it comes to law, understanding the laws and really... I guess questioning around your thought process around off oh, who's right or wrong, and I guess you always Surely kind of laugh TJ. about it. Yeah, no, TJ's TJ's awesome at it. TMO reviewed it before the kick, which is absolutely legal. Yeah, sweet, you that's didn't, yeah, you didn't tap and the so ball. Why is it ball? There'll still be our penalty, wouldn't it? Uh, like, don't tap the ball. Still our penalty. Why yeah, that's, that's a that's a fair point. Yeah. Yep. I was with the Canes this year, and you know, I actually gave him a bit of uh, law knowledge just to add to the add to the um, the, the bank. So. Um, he's been, he'll, he'll be a handful for, for players that are, uh, for referees that are refereeing the Hurricanes next year. It won't be me, that's great. Um, <laughs> but I think like the smartest guys as well are guys like, um, you know, Johnny Sexton and Michael Hooper. You know, these, again, it's just experience. You know, they know, sort of, they understand what referees, what their job is. Um, so they find the little cracks and, you know, through experience and seeing pictures, they sort of know what's right and wrong. So uh, you've got to be on your toes when you're, when you're refereeing them. Has there been one moment where a guy's got you and you've been like, oh, damn. Probably, I, I, I'd never. I actually always put my hand up if I'm wrong, um, and so that's that's one thing I've always tried to do. But uh, I can't think of one moment. But I'm, I'm sure it's happened many times and it'll happen again. I got an apology from Ben once. Oh, really? Clean out in the really? Chiefs game, and and, and uh, you, you came back. I think two or three days later, well, via Tom Coventry, and he he said that uh, that you got it wrong, and I, I was like. That made me feel better. There's some accountability. Mate, I told I told Tom that I got it right, so he just told you what you no, wanted to he hear. Had a, no, <laughs> I saw the email, mate. Because I said to him at the time, I said, there's no way a referee said he's got it wrong. And he goes, come with me. And I was like, oh, okay, good. But you know when we when you guys put a real focus around, the, you know, not leaving your feet? And, yep. uh, yeah, that was during that period, during through Super Rugby. I do. I do have images of of seeing your head pop up with your headgear on mini rucks um, yeah. that I've officiated in. Yeah. So normally with a, a normally with a confused job. look, <laughs> swearing or something <laughs> poor. <laughs> I apologise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah a, <laughs> bloody good. Hey, well, Ben, thank you very much for joining us. We've got to jump over to Ricky Swinell now and talk about a women's rugby world cup. I take it you'll be uh, putting yourself down into your seat and watching the games this Saturday. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. I'm, I'm refereeing um, one of the games here and then um, watch the other ones. Like It was an exciting last round of NPC. Um, quarterfinals are going to be awesome. Um, semis and finals. And then, yeah, it'll be good to watch some of the Women's World Cup as well. Um, it's going to be awesome. Bloody good, mate. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Cheers, Thanks, Ben. Guys. Thanks, Pleasure. mate. Right, from one man with multiple jobs to a woman with I don't know how many jobs. Ricky <laughs> Swinell, who knows what country in the world she's in, but you know, wherever she is, she's calling a sports game. Welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Definitely back at home um, in Auckland and um, very excited to make my debut on this esteemed rugby show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we'll keep you on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the family. Yeah, uh, we'll do you support North Harbour? Yeah. Yeah. Any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a neutral. I'm a neutral commentator. I'm. Oh. I'm, I'm. I'm Switzerland. Don't you worry about me. She's not on the Bay of Plenty games. Class. Class. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us, Ricky. If anyone doesn't know, Ricky is the top uh, commentator in New Zealand. She does NPC. She does FPC. She does Super Rugby. She does International. She does Sevens. She does all of those things. So, Ricky, we are really looking for your insight in a pretty special week for rugby in New Zealand and around the world. The start of the Women's World Cup. And we're starting with a record crowd at Eden Park for three great fixtures. Mm. Um, you must be schooling up right now. You must have pages and pages of notes. Tough work? 
Oh my God. Oh, honestly, I am down the rabbit hole of the internet and I, I tend to go further and further down. So I'm, I get in players and I think I sometimes know more about players than they know about themselves. Like I'm, I'm into their Instagrams. I'm, I'm translating articles from French and Fijian and Italian and all of that, but um, it's really cool. Just been, um, seen the teams arrive in the in the last couple of weeks and um seen the welcome that they've had and, and the red carpet and rolled out and that that crowd that it's looking likely for the week um, for the weekend for those for that opening match day but yeah there's um there's a lot of notes going on at the moment that is for sure how much prep goes into a single game how much time do you spend on it um Depends. Depends on the game. Depends on maybe depends on who I'm a little bit with. If, if I've got Jip next to me in the commentary box, then might have to do a little bit extra. No, no. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, probably, that's to, rough. It, it um, probably doesn't give you space to talk that, that Jip. <laughs> <laughs> No, so yeah, it really does depend. Like obviously, perhaps doing New Zealand teams. Um, doing the Black Ferns or the Sevens teams or, or, you know, even at Super Rugby where you're just that much more familiar with the players. You don't actually have to – you still do the the notes in terms of the stats and stuff, but you don't have to conscience, consciously think how who everybody is mm. as, as much as you would do if you're doing a team for the very first time. Like um, we had the Japan women a couple of weeks ago who – I've seen a few of their players on the Sevens circuit but never called them in 15s, and so you suddenly you're trying to – as well as giving them their dues and making sure you've got all the the names correct and the pronunciation, and that's probably the big one for this World Cup for sure. So um, it really does depend, and I kind of start quite early in the week um, with the stuff that you can do because the way that the teams go, they get named sort of 48 hours. So I try and get everything else done, and then once the 23s are named, then you can kind of dig a little bit deeper down. But yeah, it's um it, it's and I and I'm very anal, as anybody who has seen my notes will know that um I I'm uh, I like it all to be in a certain way and neat and tidy. Very impressive. I made note of it on Sunday. Um, so, like, I'm a little bit old school. Like, I just write and just everything's in front of me. A little bit messy, but it's 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 clear in my head what I'm doing. But Ricky has, like, the reserves with all their sort of stats and stuff on, like, little post-it notes. And when they get substituted in, she puts it over the player that was there. So the hooker, the 16 comes up. I was just like, that is... Genius. <laughs> like here I am like looking at my my reserve bench trying to work out who I'm calling, so I'm gonna steal that. Uh, Ricky, I want some insight. Stick with from me, you, grasshopper. Jip, Jipper has been saying some things in commentary which blow people's minds every day. <laughs> this week my favourite was starve your distractions, feed your focus. <laughs> <laughs> hey, to talk about work, mate. there's a lot of work that goes into that. Yeah, do you see these quotes on the paper in front of him? Sure does. Do you know, so I haven't done a game with Jip, Jipper for uh, probably a couple of seasons now because I've been away for most of this season and then, you know, we missed most of last season. So uh, I must say that the one-liners have really come on in the, in the past couple of years and yeah. there's a lot of thought and effort has gone to picking the right one for the right moment. It's, it's quite something. Uh, yeah, well, I tell you what, the reason why I've stuck with it because it became a little thing with the players. The players are giving me feedback that they love it. So then I felt pressure like to come up with new ones. I don't want to keep, you know, rattling off the same ones. So that's, it's really intensified this season because I, I, I really was like, oh, I'll just make it my point of difference. And what's your favourite so far? Oh, it's hard. Um, I do like um, um, winning's not owned its lease and they may have paid their rent in advance. I can't even remember. There were so many. Every time a South Wales Moore scored one of his oh. four tries, just oh. was thrilled to watch. There were six tries from the hookers on that game, and so you can ridiculous. imagine how he was going. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I said for a South I, I said throw him, throw him to the wolves and he'll come back leading the pack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'll be here all day. Yeah, yeah, and we'll have you next week. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We can have Chipper's quote yeah. of the week yeah, yeah. quite easily over the next little while. Ricky, the reason we want to talk with you is because you've got such incredible knowledge on the women's game. Obviously, it starts this weekend. England turn up, 25-game winning streak, super strong favourites. What makes them stand out from the pack on the field? Yeah, they, they, they are super impressive, aren't they? Um, look, I guess it goes back firstly to 2017 when they lost that final to New Zealand and then basically within the next year they became a professional program and you can see that. But, but they, are, they are big, they are strong, they are fit and they are fast, but they're also really skillful. Some of their forwards, and I know in New Zealand rugby, you know, we pride ourselves on our on our tight forwards in particular being so skillful and able to run in wide channels and all of that, and that's what these England players can do. And so they've, they can establish a game around 
around that and that allows then like they've got heaps of they've got pace out wide um they've just got so many options and so much depth as well as like hugely experienced so if you think so the black ferns played their 100th test last year on that tour england's captain sarah hunters played 130 something herself you know so that's the the vast level of experience england has got on big occasions and big stages but i think yeah like it it really does go back to um not being happy at losing that final a few years ago and, and setting on a path to, to really changing and dominating the women's game. And that is what they've been doing for the last you know couple of years. What, what impressed me most about England is you, you mentioned how they can go around you, they can go through you, but it's their ability to know what style. Do you know what I mean? They, they just have, and I've, it's probably the experience factor that you're talking about. It's, yes, they, sometimes when you can do everything, you, you don't do anything at all, if that makes sense. Whereas they are really clinical in knowing, OK, we're going to go through the middle here. Actually, they're actually starting to tighten up. Boom, we're going to width. And they've got the ability in the middle of a game to execute like that, which I think is really impressive. Yeah, and I think what they've got really good game drivers as well, and that's probably been a massive area of growth in the women's game across the board now is that that tactical now, that rugby now, that particularly as we see new generations of players, girls who are going to come through who started playing the game as kids, who are now having such a tactical awareness of the game and that strength. Also, too, the, the Premier 15s in England is a really good quality competition that they are playing, and they've kind of led the way in that area as well. So week in, week out, they're playing up against you know Canadian international US internationals, you've got French players in there as well who've all come over to play in that premiership and so they're getting such quality competition all the time and, and yeah, like I say, that that tactical awareness, um, awareness of conditions and how to play them, all of those little things have improved massively over the last few years. Just on that, Ricky, because you talk around the English ladies and the professional ranks that they've had and since that 2017 World Cup and look, Obviously, New Zealand rugby have tried to bring in the, the, the obviously the Super Rugby for the women, and obviously having the Test matches that have been the last you know twelve to eighteen months. But you talk around England; they're the favourites coming to this competition. What have you seen, and I guess with when Wayne Smith's been here, um, that they can try and bring in if they do get to that stage where they do play in England or even in France, that you think they'll be able to compete, especially against England, with where you know where they are and how well you kind of give the accolades of how well they've been in their undefeated streak. Yeah, it's going to be so fascinating. I, I hope the Black Ferns get that chance, like, um, to play mm. both of those teams and to see where they've come. Because that Northern Tour last year, it was pretty horrific, wasn't it? Like, there's no, you can't make any bones about how bad it was and, and how they've changed. And and look, they know, like Gypsy, that you, you you can't go through England. They probably won't be able to go through England. England are, their pack, their Lucys are big mm. and physical and, um, and strong. Mm. And so I don't know if New Zealand will be able to go through them. So they've almost gone, we're going to kind of go back to that almost New Zealand backyard footy style, skillful, fast. Um, they've got such, we've got such good outside backs getting them involved. And so that's going to be the thing. If we can get at least get some parity, if New Zealand can get some parity up front and not try and outmuscle mm. them and just try and outsmart them, out, outrun them almost. And so I do, because it could be a real clash of, of the styles, the way the Black Ferns are playing now. They're playing, they've basically been told to go out and play with freedom. And that is kind of what we've seen so far. When it comes to the big stage, can you still play with freedom or do you go back into your shell revert to type? I don't think so. I think Wayne Smith and that team have instilled a lot of confidence in this Black Fern side now. That's the hard part, though, isn't it? Because they haven't had a chance to test that against a quality outfit and they won't yeah. until they have to show that it works. But do you think... I, I feel yeah. like they, they sort of... That, that first test in Laurie O'Reilly... It showed to me that there's been a clear focus around the breakdown and that's that's where they're wanting to speed the game up and getting Kendra running again. And it, it showed to me that it does work if you because this next week they didn't quite get their breakdown as crisp and it just stunted their flow and momentum. So that'll be the key area, won't it? The breakdown is everything to, to New Zealand's game. Yeah, absolutely. I was just actually t chatting today to um, Kennedy Simon, the co-captain, obviously, like, loose forward, um, and that's where they are, are fully aware. If they can recycle that ball at speed, and I think you're right, like, Kendra Cox here just probably playing in that test and a couple of other, others where we saw against Japan, and, and yes, I know it's a different level of opposition. She's playing a heck of a lot better than perhaps what we saw of her last year and the year before because she's just getting such good ball to work with. And so, you know, when you've got 
Portia Woodman and Ruby Tui and Aisha Litienga and Stacey Flohler and all of that out there. There's no point having them if you can't get them the ball right. And so you, you, you'd spot on um, that breakdown area is the absolute key focus and that quick retention of ball. But, but I also think as well, that you, you mentioned that sort of backyard footy mindset. It's like they're not robotic. They, they are just reacting on what, say, if Kendra pops out, you've just got bodies in motion running into those holes and it's like they're just playing instinctively and it's you can almost sense their freedom when you're watching you know it's it's so it's such an entertaining style of footy yeah and like they're just playing like they're playing with a, with quite a lot of joy right and mm. for to have got to this point they have had to hit some pretty low lows like it was at the start of this year and late last year things were were grim and so it's been a a very quick rebuild and 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 credit to again to, to Wayne Smith, but also the players who have absolutely bought into that 100% and known that yes, it's professional now. They are going to have eyes on them. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to play a World Cup at home, and so um, you know they they are kind of walking towards that. And and as long will their best be good enough against England and France that we kind of have to wait and see. But I, I don't think they're going to die wondering. They're not going to play a boring brand of footy and try and grind out games. They're going to go out to try and win everything. Talking to those girls, what have they seen the biggest differences? You know, we've talked around Wayne Smith and how great he is and the kind of coaching resources that he's brought in. Is there kind of words around what the girls have been um, experiencing and I guess the knowledge and the experience of being coached by like a guy like Wayne Smith? Because we know the attention to detail that a guy like that brings in. You can see that with the kind of um, with the way they're playing freely. It comes back to probably their preparation has been a lot better. But yeah, maybe some messages that the girls have been saying to you around what they've found the differences under Wayne Smith and that coaching regime. His desire to, to want to see them enjoy their footy and to play really mm. well. And look, I think any of us who have had any dealings with Wayne Smith know Yes, there is that mastermind element, but he is such a um, sounds like a, such a human character. He is a, a he's a heart on the sleeve. Um, he cares about the people. Bringing in someone like Alan Bunting to on on that cultural side as well, and then I also think too, like not to downplay the access that. And, and this might sound harsh on previous reasons, the access to people that Wayne Smith has. He is the only person who could have gone in there and called Graham Henry, Mike Cron, Steve Hansen, Daniel Carter, Richie McCaw, Kevin Mialamu. Those are all guys who have been in and spoken to the team at various points. And um, again, speaking to Kennedy, she was saying uh, that some of those guys have talked about embracing the challenge of playing at home and flipping that to, to, to not be a pressure thing, to be something to really love and enjoy. And, and also too, looking back at past Black Ferns and having them welcomed in and, and being part of it. Don't underestimate the influence of Hannah Porter coming back into that to oversee things too. So um, it, it's just been a, a big shift that, you know, belated perhaps, belated a lot of resource going into them finally. And yes, COVID was an issue, but it wasn't the only issue. Um, but yeah, you can just see the the connection and the, the kind of fun that they're having as well. That's the interesting thing, isn't it? The parity. The English girls are together. They're training together. They're working together. Yeah. And, and that's happening this year with the Black Ferns, which is the thing that hasn't happened in the past, COVID or no COVID. Yeah, yeah. so they train um, when the first professional or the fully professional contracts, because they've had the semi-professional ones, right, for maybe five, four or five years now, but they were still working and juggling. And then as of January this year, they, they train in, in their hubs. So there's various hubs around the super unions and uh, super super franchises, super clubs as well. Um, and that time together, you can just see see some of the connections. And you, you see that when, um, you know, Portia Woodman can come into that side and play not go, oh gosh, I'm stepping back into the 15s to come in and, and be a dominant player as well. But you, you can't underestimate time to get time to work on not even just fitness, it's time to do all, all your prehab. Like some of them had to, yeah, they'd sit on the foam roller while they're at work, you know, and, and you guys know that that's not an optimal way to be, a, to, to you know, to perform at your best level when you're worried about, oh gosh, have I got time for lunch today as well as then getting to training and everything else. Yeah, and it's also the recovery aspect, like, you know, not having to get yeah. up at 4 a.m. to do your gym because sleep's so important. <laughs> but, you know, so all those little things play a part. Um, but I do think the access that's been created, you're right, Ricky, has been massive in terms of building their confidence and, and how fast, I suppose, because it, it has turned around quite, quite dramatically at quite a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. But I think that is due to that full-time nature as well. Who do you think are going to be some real folk? We've talked about Kendra Cox, and you've named some of the seven girls that have come back to be able to influence in games, but... If, you know, for New Zealand to win this competition, who are some really um, pivotal people in, in positions that you think um, are going to have to play really well for us to have a chance against the likes of England, those top tier nations? Yeah, I, I think um, 
obviously th there's that firepower that the well, Portia Wood and Ruby Tui Tianga, but I think you're going to have to look at the Lucy. So Liana Michele Tu, she is just come back from injury at perfect time, um, and she is she's some player, perfect physique for a loose yeah. forward, um, really confident young player, and well supported by Charmaine McMenamin at number eight, and and her coming back, and she was, you know, this time last year didn't think she'd ever play again, and so for her to be back and looking where she was, so she was Player of the Year in what 2019. Kennedy Simon player of the year last year hopefully Kennedy's fit too um, and then you have to go type 5 again so uh, you know um, Jonah Nanwu who has been in really good form mm. and has established herself as the number one lock I think now uh, if she can really front and be physical um, then she's she's key as well but th yeah those Lucy's have to fire um, they've got to be quick they've you know they've got to be strong that we, we, we will give up a bit of size and against against the likes of an England and, and perhaps even the French um, um, but yeah, that, that'd be one. Like I, Liana McKelly too could be the breakout star for New Zealand. I know we're looking a lot at the outsides, but she's yeah, she's something special. Where do you see Sarah Hidney sitting? Oh, yeah, she look. I uh, she is. I cannot tell you how much time and respect and admiration everything I have for Sarah. She is um, a really special person in New Zealand rugby. I worry that she's she's really slight, like she's she's tall but she's very lean because obviously of of your sevens background and and so uh, for her at open side that's that will be a challenge against some of those bigger loose forwards. But she's a, a quick learner. She hasn't you know she hasn't played fifteen since the last World Cup. Um, She's smart. She knows how to get the best out of herself, and she has such manner about her that she'll find ways to overcome. Perhaps, as I say, that size. Um, she and she's got speed. She's, you know, she's yes, she's a she's a sevens forward as well, but she's still a sevens player. So she she's quick and mm. and yeah, like as I say, I, I can't extol enough how much I, I admire her as a player. The the reason I ask is I'm just thinking in terms of pressure, experience, big moments, Olympics. A role in the 23, you know, against tiring bodies, you know, late in a game, mm -hmm. having that experience and leadership out there and, and big test matches, you'd have to say that's invaluable. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think that depending on the fitness of Kennedy Simon, again, um, it, where, where she's at in, in stages of the tournament, that may be Sarah's role could be to come off the bench and, and with that speed and, and that um, that calm under pressure to, to be able to do big things in, in big moments. And she's done it time and time and time again in 50 odd sevens tournaments and, you know, has has. Uh, won huge matches, and, and I, I think you did right, Jip. That that could be where she has mm. a huge impact um, on this tournament. Mm, especially if they're looking to play wide. Those other players are ball mm. carriers closer to the ruck, aren't they? Whereas if they're looking to play wide, she's your person. Yeah, and I, th I just mm. think late. I just think with all that experience, that would just be gold coming on late. And you know that she's going to be, you know, explosive and, and, and almost can swing a game, you know, with her skill set and yeah. experience. Mm. Absolutely. What about other teams? Who are the players you're looking out for on the other teams? Who are the, the guns that the public should know about? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's obviously going to be a heap of attention on England and France as the two, I guess, key rivals for New Zealand. England, Marley Packer, um, loose forward, probably best player in the world at the moment. Um, defensively, demon, massive work rate. Uh, Zoe Orcroft, who is, in fact, named the best player in the world at the moment. She was World Rugby Player of the Year last year. She was the one who absolutely carved up the Black Ferns lineup last year. Uh, Emily Scarrett for England, too. I mean, most people will probably know her. Probably one of the best, if not, you know, to, to ever play the game. For, for England, um, oh, it's for France. Oh, oh, France have got two halfbacks. I, again, we're yeah. talking about having to pick New Zealand's wingers. The two French halfbacks, Sonsu and Bourdain, have been two of the best in, in years. Mm. So they've got a real one-two punch um, with them. The French captain Gailu May, I mean, she's brilliant. She apparently is carrying a bit of a knee injury coming into the tournament as well. So um, that might just be a, a bit of an issue for them. And then, look for some of the other teams. Um, Scotland and Wales. They got a couple of real flyers. Jasmine Joyce, you would have probably seen her at the, in the GB team at the Olympics. She's she's really a, a special player, um, absolute electric. Rona Lloyd for Scotland. Um, Sophie De Goody, the Canada captain, just tough and hard and dynamic, and and you know a really good young captain as well. So I mean, I could we'd be here for another hour if I keep, <laughs> keep going through. So that'd, that'd be a couple. That'd be a couple to pick out. Before you go, actually, Ricky, 
You were at the Harbour mm. Auckland game. Um, RTS on the wing. You like it? Auckland Taranaki. Auckland Taranaki, what? sorry, yeah. No, Auckland Taranaki. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I thought I was losing yeah. the plot. No. Uh, Auckland Taranaki, yeah. Look, I, what I like is that he, he um, and it was miserable as the person who was sitting out on the sideline. I can attest to how bad the conditions were. Um, I liked how involved he was getting himself on a day which was no day for wingers. And he was in there standing in at first receiver, wanting to get hands on the ball. Um, I, you know, I, I see the, a couple of thoughts about, you know, maybe they got the call because that was a late change to put him on that wing. That wasn't yes. the original team. And I did it did actually run through my brain. I was like, I wonder if the Auckland coaches have had a call um, to, to move him out, uh, move him out wide. So. Yeah, that was always the thought when he came to the game that that would be a better place yeah. to start him um, initially and then move him in a bit like what we've seen with Ricky Iwani. And so, I, yeah, I did. I liked it. I just it really loved his involvement um, and his willingness to get stuck in and get involved. It's very much like the fullback role yeah. in the NRL. You know, like you've got that ability yeah. to rove. You can hover in around the ruck. You can inject yourself. So it was always going to be a success. We, we, we all knew that. We discussed it last week. So I think, you know, you don't need to see that too many times um, to, to know that he's going to be good at it. And, and I certainly think he could fit in at international rugby level um, quite comfortably in the wing. And, and that's why we went to the length of saying that, you know, maybe the 23 jersey is a great role for him. All right, Ricky. Well, do you want to stay around for some punishing North Harbour chat or do you want to leave? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, at least tell us, uh, Bay of Plenty Waikato. Well, of course I'm going to back the Bay. I understand. Hey, Ricky, thanks so much for all your time and your insight. I'm sure we'll touch back to you again soon. See you, Ricky. Oh, no worries. Nice to chat, guys. See you soon. Ciao. OK, lads. Harbour versus Auckland. Roger Tuivasa on the... Tuivasa Shack on the wing against your boys. They were looking strong on the weekend. You guys were worried about going down to Invercargill, and look what happened. Wow. Yeah. That was, again, it's, it's around four key players. Well, probably five in the weekend. Uh, Booth and Gatlin, and then Lee, mm. Stevenson, um, and Mark Talao. And, and, man, you'd have to think, Gatlin, obviously, Tavita's got to go back to Japan, but Sean and uh, Mark, All Blacks 15 team announced October 9th, which is selected by the All Blacks selectors as well. Like, man. Yep. Can't go past them at the moment. Can you can catch those two games games live on Sky in November against Ireland, eh? Oh. And against the Barbarians. Scott they're they're going to be great games too. Yep. Imagine Ireland Day in Dublin. Oh, please. <laughs> if only I was still playing. Quickly, the predictions for the NPC quarterfinals. Harbour, Auckland. Harbour. 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 Don't need, don't need to say anything. Yeah. Harbour. <laughs> no, I don't know why I asked. Wellington v Hawks Bay. Wellington. Wellington. Canterbury. <laughs> Canterbury. No way that Canterbury loses that game. No <laughs> oh, brilliant. No way. As simple as that. I thought he was out to go, yeah, there's love, no way they'll I take love, them lightly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was I no love, way I agree with you. No I love way. that Gyps, I love that Jeff, Gyps, obviously, Nilton have had a great year. And look, crazier things have happened in rugby. But there's no way they beat Canterbury down in Canterbury. <laughs> have crazier things happened in rugby? I'm not sure crazier things have happened in rugby. I, de I definitely feel like um, <laughs> you've put the mocker on them. <laughs> That's for sure. Put me, put me in the northern, put me in the northern um, um, analysis this week. Put my mug up there and no, they won't. Of, but, uh, they, they're too busy <laughs> fishing and surfing, mate. They ain't watching this. There's no <laughs> way, mate. There's no the way. The Canterbury boys are, though. Plus. <laughs> They'll be like, come on, Bryn, us. help us out. I'm backing the boys from the north. <laughs> can't be all the same. We this can't is... be all PC. I'll back, I'll, I'll back the, the Coldy tree. Yeah, this is 2 0 v South Africa, except, yeah. except fewer people care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, at, least, uh, at least that was realistic. At least that was realistic. <laughs> 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 I tell you what, I hope you're not planning to go north anytime soon. I was just going to say, mate, if we uh, if we lose, if, um, if Canterbury lose this one, I will be the first. I'll wear a Northern jersey. I'll go buy a Northern jersey and I'll wear a Northern jersey the whole, the whole, um, the whole podcast. And Waikato v Bob. Waikato. Waikato. Probably the match of the round, I think. 
Um, probably been the closest one, I reckon, but I'll go Waikato. Wouldn't be surprised if they plenty got up there. 50-50 for me. Yeah. Is that Waikato. all home? Are we picking all home teams? Uh, yes, all home teams. But, I mean, that's because they're the form mm. teams, right? Mm. Like, in the end, you've got those two things in your favour. Yep. Yep. Okay, well, thanks very much, Bryn. It's been a very entertaining episode. Catch you again next week. Thanks, Chipper. Enjoy your footy this weekend. And uh, thank you all for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Catch us online on YouTube. Catch us on Sky. Catch us on an audio pod. We'll see you next time. Matewa.